Amen. Thank you, John. I think the Lord wanted you to sing that without the accompaniment. It was beautiful. Let's look to the Lord for just a moment before we start. Father, as we open your word, we ask that you would open our eyes to see wondrous things from your word that is forever settled in heaven. And Father, as we consider this passage today, we pray, Lord, that you'd use it to work in our hearts, our lives, to be better equipped, Lord, to serve you and pressing on to the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. I want to give, make a little comment here before we get to the message. Uh, the message is going to be two parts. So we're going to start this morning and we'll finish this evening. So if you're sitting there saying, when is he going to end? When is he going to end? Well, we're going to end this evening. <laughs> Not through the whole time, but coming back <laughs> at six o'clock tonight. You know, it's kind of like, I know, uh, I think most of you here remember the old Batman show, you know, in the, back in the 60s, I think it was. And, you know, they, they had two one half hour shows right after one another. And so the first show would end with, you know, a, a cliffhanger. You know, Batman is about to be eaten by a monster or something. And then the next show begins with him, you know, getting away and seeing how that cliffhanger is resolved. Well, it's not going to be exactly like that, but it is going to be uh, going to divide it up into two parts. Look at the verse one more time. Let's read through it and then we'll begin. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they fall away, to renew them again unto repentance seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Those who believe that a Christian can lose his salvation often quote this verse. And it was the only verse you had in the entire Bible. I could see how they might come to that conclusion. But when we compare spiritual to spiritual, is, which is how we are to discern the word of God, we see that this cannot be so. For the Bible says that when one is saved, he has everlasting life. The scriptures also say that the Father holds us in his hand and the Savior holds us in his hand, and he will not let us go. It is not us who holds on to God. God holds on to us. So what then is the truth that the Lord wants us to see in this passage? And even among those who, you know, hold that uh, a Christian, once somebody is genuinely born again, uh, is saved that they cannot lose their salvation. But even among people who hold to that, there are various interpretations. But I want to share with you what's on my heart. Not so much, it's important what's on my heart, but you know what we can see in this passage. <clears throat> The first thing that we're going to look at is what is impossible. Something is impossible here. 
What is it that's impossible? Impossible means it can not happen. It cannot be done. That is, you know, God's word. Okay, the first phrase there in verse 4 says, for it is impossible. Now before that, and actually it's a clause, is completed, there's a lot of information in between. If you go down to verse 6, for it is impossible if they fall away to renew them again unto repentance. The falling away here is not simply somebody who has fallen into sin. It is not simply someone who maybe has been confused with some false doctrine. But this is a person who has turned totally away from the truth, from God, from his word. It's almost like a reverse of what happens in salvation. In salvation, a person turns from their sin, turns from their self, turns from the world and makes a 180 degree turn to God to believe, to receive, to be born again. But this is a person who appeared to make that turn, but then turned back. A complete rejection, denial of the truth of God's word, a denial of Christ, and turning back to the world, to unbelief, to sin. It is impossible for those who have fallen away to renew them again unto repentance. It sounds to me like this verse is saying that someone can come to the point where they look like they were in Christ, but they turned completely away and turned back again 180 degrees and now are denying him. It can come to a point where they cannot be saved. They cannot go back to repentance. Now, this is not a judgment we can make. I cannot look at somebody and say, that person has come to the point where he cannot be saved. He is uh, an apostate. He has fallen away. And so he cannot be saved. I cannot make that determination. You cannot make that determination. There are things we can judge. We can judge a person's testimony. We can judge the words they say. Is this scriptural or is it unscriptural? We can judge, we can look at their life and say, are they leading a Christian life? We can look at their, you know, their participation in the things of the Lord. And we can make judgments in those areas. We can make decisions when somebody you know, applies to be a member of Bethel Bible Church. You know, they, they um, meet with the elders. And one thing we want to hear is, what is your testimony of salvation? And what is it that you believe? And we want to make sure that they have a clear testimony of truly being born again. We want to make sure uh, that they, you know, they, even if they testify of being a born-again believer in Christ, that they hold to the same doctrines that we hold to. And not everybody who has applied to membership at Bethel Bible Church has been accepted. Because either there's been a problem with their testimony of salvation, or there's been a problem with doctrines that they hold. So we can judge those things, but we cannot judge when someone has come to the point 
where they cannot repent and come back to the Lord. Only the Lord knows that. I mean, as far as we're concerned, from our point of view, as long as somebody is breathing, as long as their heart is beating, as long as they are cognizant and can understand and respond, they can still get saved. We still need to witness to them. We still need to minister to them. We still need to be a, have a testimony before them. The only person you can know, well, there's two people who can know. One is yourself. The other is God. So what is, poss what is impossible for those who fall away to come back, to be renewed, to repentance, to come back to the Lord? Then if we go back up to verse 4. We are given a list here of whom, what are some of the characteristics of these who have fallen away? The first point, well, let's go ahead and look at the verses. Well, we'll just go one at a time. Verse 4 again, for it is impossible for those who were enlightened. Enlightened. Enlightenment talks about a, a head knowledge, knowing truth, knowing fact. And these folks had a head knowledge of the truth. They, they gave an outward uh, approval and agreement to uh, the, the truth of God's word. Um, and uh, they, uh, they know, they know salvation. They know uh, what God did by sending his son to die for our sins. They know the truths about the Lord Jesus Christ. They know the truths about, you know, how the world came into being. And they know the truths of, they've, they've been confronted with these truths about how, what's going to happen in the future, how we are to live today uh, in Christ. They were once enlightened. They had a head knowledge. Now, there is nothing wrong with having knowledge of the Word of God. We ought to have knowledge one of the primary functions of the church is being an educational institution. We are here to teach, to equip one another to get involved in the ministry, and we do that by learning uh, the Word of God, reading it, um, meditating on it, studying it, uh, memorizing it. And the Bereans, remember, Paul mentioned the Bereans. He said that, that they were more noble than the Thessalonians because they received the word of God with all readiness of mind. Yes, they received it in their heart, in their life, but they also received it in readiness of mind. And they searched the scriptures daily to see whether those things were so. They went back to the scriptures. They studied the scriptures that they had to make sure that the things that they were being taught and the things that they were being told, even the things they learned from, taught from Paul, to make sure that these are really true according to the scriptures. And, you know, Pastor Frank has said, Many times, you know, don't believe me just because I say it. Believe it because it's what's in God's word, the scriptures. Uh, but these folks have had an enlightenment. And, you know, isn't it interesting how the world can sometimes grab pieces of the truth, but they can't grab the whole thing? You know, I remember... When I 
was growing up. You know, when you heard about dinosaurs. You know, what were we being taught? Well, in the public schools, and I was in a public school. You know, what were we being taught about dinosaurs? We're being taught, well, they died out slowly over millions and millions and tens of millions of years. But then, about the 80s or 90s, suddenly there was a change. Suddenly you hear about this mass extinction that the dinosaurs all died out at one time in one event. And, you know, as a Christian, you say, wow, you know, are they, are they saying that, you know, there was a flood, a universal flood, that killed the dinosaurs? No, it was a comet. A comet hit the earth. And, hey, you know, there could have been a comet because the Bible talks about the waters coming from heaven and com comets usually are mostly water, right, ice. And so it, was, it could have been a comet involved. But it wasn't that comet coming out of heaven that killed the dinosaurs. It was the flood. It was the flood that God brought about on the earth to judge uh, man and to judge man's sin. Now, some may have survived in the ark, but apparently because of the change of climate and so forth, and you know, I don't want to get into all the science because I really am not a scientist, <laughs> um, but they died out all at once. So they grabbed a piece of the truth, but they can't get the whole thing because their eyes are blinded by Satan. So these for whom it is impossible to repent were enlightened. They did have the truth. They had it in their heads. They tasted it of the heavenly gift. What's the heavenly gift? What is the gift of God? The gift of God is salvation, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The Bible says, you know, we thank God for his unspeakable gift. The gift, they taste it of the gift. Salvation is not something you taste. Now, I know there's a verse in the Bible that says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, okay, taste. But you got to go beyond the taste. Now, I don't cook anything at home, okay? Two talents I don't have. I don't have the talent to taste. I mean, to I can taste. My tasting is very fine. I don't have the, the talent to cook. I don't have the talent to sing, <laughs> like Brother John did this morning. And um, maybe someday, Brother John, you know, we'll sing a duet up in heaven, Okay. <laughs> I'll have better uh, vocal cords back then. Up, I mean, then, not back then. Okay, but you don't taste salvation. You are immersed in it. Oh, let me back up a little bit, give you my illustration. Okay, when Susan cooks something, and sometimes she'll say, take a taste. And, uh, you know, take a little spoonful or something and a little sip so I can taste it and tell, ah, this is good. It's great. I can't wait till I can eat it. I can't wait till I can devour it. I can't wait till I can get it into me so it, it gets into my system and it, it nourishes me. Maybe it'll make me fat too, but I want to devour it. Salvation is devouring it. Salvation is receiving it all, not just taking a taste of it. And maybe these people, maybe they, you know, made an outward profession of Christ. Maybe they, you know, they, because they had this, they were enlightened, 
So they, they knew the words to say. They knew the, the Christian language. They knew how to act. They knew how to live. They knew what they were supposed to do. They taste it. Salvation. But they didn't receive it. In Romans 6, 4, it talks about uh, being crucified with Christ, being buried with him by baptism into death and uh, raised again with him in newness of life. We have the fullness of Christ. When we are saved, we are immersed into the body of Christ. When we are saved, we don't just taste salvation. So they were enlightened. They tasted of the heavenly gift. And then the next thing it tells us there, we're made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Now this one's a little hard because this one sounds, well, you know, partakers of the Holy Ghost. We don't partake of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost partakes within us. The Holy Spirit, when the person is truly born again, comes to dwell in us. The Holy Spirit fills us. The Holy Spirit empowers us. The Holy Spirit directs us, gives us direction in, in life and decisions. The Holy Spirit enables us to understand God's word and apply to live God's word. It's not just somehow there's a little effect on our life. And even the unsaved can be affected by the presence of believers. Remember Paul talking to uh, writing about, you know, if uh, you live with an unsaved spouse, he says, stay with that spouse. You know, if he or she does not leave you, stay with them because your presence there sanctifies that home. It brings God's blessing on the home having a saved spouse within the home. And he says, and perhaps, perhaps by the testimony of your life, perhaps your unsaved spouse will come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ by your testimony, by your words, by your life before him or her. So they partook of the effects of the Holy Spirit, but without being indwelled and filled. Number four, and have tasted the good word of God. Again, here's this word taste, sampling it, seeing, yeah, there's some good thing. Uh, in it, but not, not being nourished by it, not living by it. In Psalm 1, David says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Read Psalm 119. I believe John read a couple verses from Psalm. Psalm 119, 150 verses in that Psalm. It's all about the word of God and the importance and the power of the word of God. In David's life, the word, again, they, you know, we talked about the Brians already, they searched the scriptures 
uh, daily the importance of the Word of God, that the Word of God is our, our food. It's that which nourishes us. It's that which strengthens us. It's that which, as we read, as we ingest it, as we believe it, and as we are led by the Holy Spirit, uh, to be able to live for the Lord, to be able to serve the Lord, to be able to love the Lord with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind. Uh, the Sunday school memory verse for this month is a very easy one. Five words. If you love me, keep... Oh, yeah, six words, sorry. Never was good at math. If you love me, keep my commandments. How do we know what his commandments are? Oh, well, I know. Uh, doesn't it say in there somewhere uh, godliness or cleanliness next to godliness? A lot of people think that's in the Bible. Okay? But it's not. You don't have to take a bath every night. <laughs> no, not really. Okay? But uh, we know his commandments by getting into his word. And his commandments we find from in the beginning God to even so come Lord Jesus. It's all his commandments and they're in his word. Uh, they're given to us so we can love him. We can show our love for him by keeping him, by keeping them. And even that by the power of the Holy Spirit. So they've tasted the word of God. And then the fifth thing we see here in the last part of chapter, uh, verse 5. And the power of the world to come. Have tasted, again, here's tasting, tasting. Tasted the power of the world to come. There are temporal benefits to living the Christian life. When a Christian obeys his Lord Jesus Christ, when a Christian lives his or her life according to the word of God by the power uh, of the Holy Spirit, you know there are there are blessings in doing that, but even for the unsaved, there are blessings in following, even in a, 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 a carnal, maybe carnal is not the best word, but just within your own power and taking some of these principles from the word of God, some of these commands and directions from the King of kings, Lord of lords, the, the one who will reign forever and ever, and taking these things and applying them in our own lives. I'll give you an example. Now, you can be many, many, many examples, but this is just one. If you take the Lord's teaching on sexual immorality, on adultery and fornication and so forth and so on. And you, you live, you learn, and you live by that standard. You live by the standard of keeping yourself pure until you are married to a person of the opposing sex. Okay, And then in marriage, being faithful to that marriage partner, there, is, there are benefits to that. There are temporal benefits to that. Uh, there are health benefits to that. People who are sexually promiscuous, you know, are full of disease. Now, some of those diseases are very grave and very dangerous, but some of them are, you know, maybe not so dangerous, you know, just have, you know, a rash or an itch, but 
Even in that case, many of those they found can eventually cause cancer down the line. So there's health benefits to abiding by the teaching of the Word of God. There's emotional benefits. Whenever there is a one flesh relationship, whenever there is a physical relationship between two people and breaking it apart, you know, it, it always causes a hurt. It always causes emotional stress and strain and grief. Uh, and, you know, just sometimes, you know, just driving people sometimes to very extreme uh, actions. Um, so, you know, and, and again, that's just one example. But, you know, if you take, learn these things, you learn the law of the king of kings, and even in, you know, your own ability, try to live by them, there can be benefits. Tasting uh, the powers of the world to come. So what, I, what we're talking about here, what we're looking at here in these for whom it is impossible for them to come again to repentance is basically these were people who look like Christians, talk like Christians, smelled like Christians, but had never truly come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. They were still, you know, trusting in themselves, trusting in what they did, trusting maybe in a, in a ritual or a ceremony or even a prayer. If it was just a prayer, but not really receiving it into my life. They had a facade of genu genuine faith. It looked good to everybody on the outside, but inside, they were lost. And you know, I've heard the testimony, and I've shared this with you before, of preachers, preachers preaching in Bible-believing churches, preaching the Word of God, preaching, even preaching the gospel, but God showed them they were not saved. Yeah, they're, they're telling other people to do this, but they've never done it themselves. And thank God, thank God that God revealed that to them. You know, you might think, wow, you know, that'd be pretty horrible. You know, you're a preacher, you're, you're, you're pastoring a church, you're preaching the word, you're, and now you got to admit to people you never were saved. No, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. It's a wonderful thing. You know, sometimes Satan plants seeds of doubt in even the hearts of genuine believers. And he, when, he, when he does, we can't sweep it under the rug. We can't bury it in a hole somewhere. We need to confront it. We need to get the counsel of godly people. And maybe, you know, maybe you are saved, but you know, again, Satan is just planting those doubts, or maybe you never really have been saved. And you've all heard the testimony of people who said, yeah, I was in a summer camp and I made a profession of faith, but, you know, I've come to realize I really didn't receive Christ at that time. I didn't become a born-again believer. You know, the facade is kind of like the old westerns. You know, the, you have the little, you know, the town and the, the dirt street going down the middle and wood sidewalks and buildings. That town is a facade. Nobody lives in that town. Most of those buildings are just the front and there's nothing in the back except maybe a couple of studs holding them up. And then the ones, you know, maybe where they're going to use as part of a show, maybe a general store, you go into it and you see things and shells and a place where you pay for it. 
but it's a facade. Nobody buys anything in that store. It's a facade. It's unreal. It's ingenuine. And for these folks, their faith was a facade. And let's just consider for a few moments a biblical example of possibly a biblical, biblical example of this. A man named Judas Iscariot. Judas was called by the Lord to be one of his twelve. Judas, I mean, how could you be in a better church than the one Judas was in? How could you hear, how could you have a better spiritual leader than the one Judas had? How can you hear better messages than the messages Judas heard? How can you see more powerful uh, examples of, of God and what he can do and accomplish than the things that, G, that, that Judas saw. Not only did the Lord call Judas to be among his twelve, but he was, he was given a very important position. He was the treasurer. You know, thank God we have a very godly and very wise treasurer in our church. Very important a position within the church, very important a ministry. And then that was Judas. Now, Judas was skimming a little bit off the top, okay? But nobody knew that. Well, the 11 didn't know it. Nobody ever questioned Judas. Nobody ever said, you know, to the Lord, you know, I don't know about that Judas. When Jesus sent out his disciples two by two to go to the Jews to preach to them the gospel of the kingdom, and now is the time to receive. One of them that went out was Judas. I don't know who he went out with, doesn't tell us. But if he didn't go out, there would have been an odd group, right? It would either have been one person going by themselves or it would have been a group of three. But the Bible tells us they went out two by two. So Judas went out sharing the, the, the word, sharing the gospel, showing the power of God uh, to the Jewish people to bring them to faith in Jesus. In John 17, this is the Lord's prayer for his disciples and for his, his followers, even for us. And in that prayer, he mentions that, you know, you have given me these 12. And he says, I had Jesus praying to the Father, I have lost none. And then he says, except, except the son of perdition. See, as far as we know, nobody else expect, um, suspected Judas, but the Lord knew all along. And even at the last Passover meal that the believers held together, even when the Lord said, one of you are going to betray me, did anybody point to Judas and says, it's him. I know it's him. What were they doing? Is it I? Is it I? And even when Jesus offered Judas the, the sauce to dip his bread in, I don't think they even still suspected at that point that Judas was the one who would betray them. He looked good, on the outside, I mean, he must have been saying a lot of good things. He must have been doing things. You know, can, can an unbelieving, somebody who's not a genuine believer, can they do works for God? Well, look at Matthew chapter 7. Those who will stand before Christ in the end of time. And they'll say, 
We've done many good works in your name. They even said, we've cast out demons in your name. I've never cast out a demon. I don't think I ever want to cast out a demon. But they did, or at least they said they did, and Christ didn't deny it. Christ never said, oh, you never did any good things. Christ didn't say, oh, you didn't cast out any demons. But he told them, depart from me. Why? Why? Because I never knew you. That's part one. Part two will be tonight. Okay, so we've considered these who, for whom it is impossible, having fallen away, to come again to repentance. We've looked at characteristics of them. And tonight we'll look at why. Why it is impossible. Okay, I'm going to close in a word of prayer and John will come up and lead us in a closing song. Let's pray. Father, we give thanks to you again for your son, for your love, that you loved us even while we were yet sinners and sent your son to die for our sins. As Father, we not one of us, not one of us, is deserving of all that you bless us with and give us. And Father, help us uh, to understand, Lord, what you'd have for us from this hard passage. Lord, but you open up our eyes. Your will be accomplished in Jesus' name. Amen.